All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the show. We'll get started briefly. We'll just give folks a little bit of time to connect to the live stream and we'll kick things off. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. All right. Let's go ahead and kick off the show. Hello and welcome to a live edition of Design Future Now, a podcast from AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. On this show, we have conversations with designers and other creative professionals to learn about how they've designed their lives and how they're thinking about and crafting the future. My name is Li Shan Huang, broadcasting from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I am the Director of Design, Learning, and Content here at AIGA. And for the folks tuning in live, we always like to know, where are you tuning in from today? You can let us know in the comments, say hello, connect with your fellow participants. And just a quick reminder about our Code of Conduct. This event and other AIGA events are governed by the Code of Conduct. Basically, keep it nice, friendly, professional, and we'll be A-OK. -okay. So without further ado, our guest today is joining us from Ottawa, Canada, our friends in the North. He is a creative director, agency owner, author, creativity professor, and a founding member of RGD, the Association of Registered Graphic Designers, sort of like our Canadian counterparts to AIGA here in the US. And he's the chief creative officer of an agency called Green Melon. And we'll be talking today also about his own design story, where he's been in his career and his coaching and mentoring practice at ThinkSmith, and as well as his upcoming book, his second book, Don't Look for Zebras. So Robert Smith, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to <laughs> everybody in, the, in their time zones. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for having me on this. This is a, a great honor, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And just to acknowledge the audience, it looks like we've got uh, Toronto representing some New York, some Atlanta. Uh, so it's good to hear from people from different uh, parts of the world. Uh, so Robert, tell us a little bit more about your story. You wear many hats, uh, like a lot of us these days, uh, educator, run an agency, but you also have this um, practice where you're coaching, mentoring, and you wrote a book. So where do you want to start with that or help, help us thread the needle a little bit? I guess I get, I guess I get bored really easily. Um, no, I think the, there's a, there's a common thread in all of this, and it's simply that I had uh, a very poor um, high school experience. Uh, going to a high school that was very focused on the sciences and the maths and that, and I was uh, artistic, um, and um, really did not know what I was going to be doing uh, as a career, and felt kind of out of place until I had a, a very enlightened. Um, uh, guidance counselor who said you should go into graphic design I said great what's that uh, so he brought out a book and showed me this stuff and it was literally that you know that light bulb moment of wow you can make a living doing this and he's like yeah so he helped me uh, by signing me up to a, uh, a college three-year program and you know I went from like literally just coasting through high school to an A plus uh, president's list student um, so it was a massive metaphor uh, um, um, uh, change in my life. And I've never forgotten that. And uh, so the profession has become very dear to me. And so that has led me through all the different stages, uh, working for different agencies and starting my own, um, and then teaching, um, as well as mentoring and writing about it, because I, uh, I appreciate what I do so much and honestly. Uh, after close to 30 years in the industry, I can say that I, I, I get up every morning excited to be doing what I do. Uh, and I just want that for other people. Yeah, that's amazing. And we'll talk about your book in a little bit and how you're encapsulating some of this wisdom and making it accessible to more people. Um, and you're also doing like these one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching, mentoring sessions with folks. Okay. You mentioned your high school teacher who helped steer you towards graphic design? Were there other mentors along the way that you wanted to shout out or mention that have helped you get to where you are now? Well, I think it's, uh, I, what I've experienced over the years is, is that I've experienced a very um, nurturing and uh, supportive industry. Um, one of my um, design heroes uh, at the time was a, a Canadian designer, Neville Smith, um, who uh, one of his more famous pieces is that the Black Cat Cafe um, poster that he did. 
uh, he was a big influence on me uh, and I was able to to meet him at an event and, and chat and he was very open. And since then, I've had such a great um, uh, opportunity as I go along to reach out. Uh, Duffy Design was another uh, agency that was a big influence on me uh, when I was at, at college. And I've since been able to meet with Joseph and, and the team there and chat with them. Um, you know, David Carson, Stefan Zeigmeister, um, and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And here in Canada with uh, Didi Katona at, at, at um, uh, Concrete and agencies like that. I'm just shamelessly name dropping here, but but it's only because of, that I that these are people that I've genuinely had great conversations with, multiple conversations with, and they've been very genuine with their time um, and and supportive. Uh, and I and I think that's that's truly wonderful. Yeah, I think maybe it's helpful for us to also define or explore some of these different nuances of a word like a mentor. And you also do coaching, so it's worth kind of disambiguating some of these things. We've been exploring this a lot in this show and other AIG programming. And for some, you know, a mentor could just be an influence or an inspiration, somebody you haven't even met or talked to in person. Uh, but it could also be someone where you're meeting with one-on-one. It could be an informal thing, a formal thing. So how do you think about and define a word like mentor? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. In fact, I'm going to be posting about that, um, where it's you know, a teacher, uh, sorry, teacher, mentor, coach. You know, what's their friends and what do you need? Um, and uh, for a while there, I was calling myself a coach, but I didn't feel that that really um, uh, defined what I do, because I really do weave in um, some of my teaching. So, for example, I, uh, with my one on ones, when I'm mentoring, uh, I'm using the term mentoring right now. Um, there's always homework. <laughs> you know, I always give them homework that I can review, that we can go over. Um, I get them doing heavy lifting uh, in their career so that there's some ownership with that. But also it's a guided process. So whether it's career development or it's developing their freelance or agency, um, you know, all these different paths. I've got workbooks and things like that. So um, I don't think that fits in the in the coaching category necessarily, or the or the mentoring. Um, it's kind of a hybrid. Um, so it's it's definitely not um, active listening, yeah. um, which I find a lot of times you get that. And it's like, you know, uh, oh, the client didn't like this logo. Okay, well, how does that make you feel? Right. That's not helping anybody, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I try to unpack as much as possible on that. And that's what these these uh, one-on-ones are about, and eventually some some group coaching as well. But right. um, it's a very fair, uh, and kudos to you for addressing this <laughs> with the AIG because you know people people don't understand like where what am I going to get out of this process? So that's what I would suggest to anybody out there looking at it is is just if you find somebody who has a voice that you you connect with that reach out to them and just say you know i'd I'd be interested in in one-on-ones with you or group coaching but what is it that i will get out of this you know um how does it work yeah it sounds like it's a definition to be negotiated between yeah. people in a relationship, right? Like we can't just like claim a dictionary definition or there's multiple dictionary yeah. definitions is between you and your mentor, you and your coach. And it could involve other dynamics that are like a teacher student uh, relationship yeah. or uh, <laughs> something else. Right. But yeah. it could be anything from just having a friend who's a sounding board, who just listens to you and poses questions to something that's more structured with a curriculum, with a point of view and advice even. Exactly. And I think that's really important. So really at the end of the day, you've got to understand yourself, what, what it is you're looking for um, as far as, or, or some sort of a definition of, you know, at the end of this, I want to have, you know, less imposter syndrome. I want to have, you know, a functional freelance business. I want to have you know, these sorts of things. And that'll help. Uh, not that you have to have all the answers, but some sort of a, an idea of what you're looking for. And then you work with that person um, to see if that is, is a fit for them in their skill set and in their delivery. You know, it's like Wonderful. going to a car dealership and just saying, yeah, I'd like a car. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, sports car, truck, what, what, what's your budget? What's, you know, so. 
Right. You have to inform yourself going into the relationship as well. It's not like a, I mean, I kind of cringe at this memory before, but like I've definitely in my, like earlier in my career, gone to coffees with people and be like, won't you be my mentor? And it's like, I didn't really know what I wanted or what I needed. It was more like, oh, well, I, I heard that I should have one. So (laughs) Exactly. And when I first started, before I, uh, you know, I was thinking about, because again, with the teaching, I've had a lot of students reach out and say, can you, can we continue? Uh, helping through my, my my career. And so I was trying to understand, okay, well, where does this fit? Because it's a big, and if there's so many coaches out there, there's so many mentors out there, there's so many venues. And I thought, well, you know, why would I be part of the noise? But really at the end of the day, it's about connection, right? So you really do. And, and I've had two recent, uh, uh, one woman from California that reached out and I uh, coached her. And for her, it came down to, to voice. Um, she had researched and she said, your tone, the way you approach things um, uh, spoke to me. You know, and I'm sure there's, there's lots of people who went to my website looking for that and the tone didn't work for them and they didn't yeah. engage. So, yeah. Totally. So what are some of the goals that your mentees have articulated for themselves? Like what sorts of goals are you helping people reach in your work together? Uh, I think the biggest thing is focus. Um, and they don't come to me identifying that as an issue. You know, I need more focus or I need, they come to me, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're creative people and we love challenges and we love um, exploring and, um, and problem solving and things like that. And we're really good at it for our clients. But when I have people come in for coaching and that, they're like, okay, here's all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm like, Whoa, okay. Yeah. <laughs> What is it that, you you know, we have this need to be everything to everybody, right? So a lot of times what it's doing, whether it's their career path or their um, building a freelance business or whatever, it's like, who do you want to speak to? Who would you, how would you define your audience? What do you bring to the table? Um, You know, and and, and it's both for selling yourself to clients or also uh, uh, selling yourself to employers, uh, potential employers. Um, so again, a lot of this comes back to self, um, awareness, um, and we need to take ourselves through that process that we take our clients through, you know, we're always doing that with our clients. Like, okay, well, you need to define your audience a little better. What's our avatars? Who's our target audience? If we know these questions, we don't do them for ourselves. Yeah. And it's good to have, and, and just like with our clients, um, you're too close to the problem. Right? You're making assumptions. And, and so you just need that sounding board in a lot of cases uh, to help you just really get down. What I like to say is you don't want to be coffee. You want to be espresso. You want to be small and strong. Awesome. So I'm going to do a quick reset and just welcome people who have joined the stream midstream. I'm here with Robert Smith, creative director, author, coach, mentor. We've been talking about mentorship in a design career, and we're also now going to talk about his new book, Don't Look for Zebras. And also for the audience, if you do have questions, feel free to type in the chat in the comments uh, here on LinkedIn, and we'll surface those um, if we've got some time. So tell us about this book, Don't Look for Zebras. It's based on an expression Uh, But what does that expression mean and how does it all fit in? Yeah, so the expression is, and I came across it, it's um, uh, a doctor uh, that came up with this and it's taught to interns, um, mainly for ER, when you're triaging patients, when they come in. And the idea is when you hear, his actual quote is, when you hear hoofbeats, don't think zebra, think horse. Okay, And obviously that's a North American thing. But the idea is the likelihood of you seeing a zebra versus a horse, you know, is, is something you've got to find. So when somebody presents in the ER with a sore stomach, well, don't think of some strange disease. Uh, they may have just had bad sushi. Right. right? So in, in our world right now, we're, uh, and I'm talking about the creative industry, people who make their living um, creating with clients, um, we're dealing with deadlines. We're dealing with, um, and particularly right now, we're living in a, an on-demand um, society. So it's like, you know, so our deadlines are shorter um, and the creative process is not shorter. So the other thing is because we are artistically inclined that we tend to look for, we want, we want that, that original idea, that 100% new thing, like we really want to kill it, right? And uh, that takes too much time uh, if the budget isn't there. Um, and frankly, 
New is, makes people uncomfortable. Okay, They're, they need definition, they need context. So again, when you hear the hoofbeats, think horse, like, okay, that makes more sense, a straight line. Um, so when we're creating for clients and that, it's try not to look for the obscure or the truly unique. Um, you got to look for something that is palatable, something that is um, that the, the your audience will align with. Um, and that's by no means uh, dumbing it down at all, because we all love clever creative. But if you take apart clever creative, there's an essence there that, oh, well, I've seen that before. You know, it's like it's a new voice. It's a new tact. And particularly right now, when we're looking at an audience that is somewhat segmented and we have niche markets and niche audiences and that, that they will uh, attach themselves to something that makes sense to them, like a story that makes sense. Right. I think there's almost something about the flip side of social media these days that decontextualizes a lot of work or a lot of portfolios. You also profile someone you call Amanda in the book, who's a designer you mentored, who was dealing with some of this stuff, also on the topic of healthcare, right? Designing for a hospital versus and feeling bad about some of these award-winning designs that she was seeing out in the world and trying to compare herself. Can you tell us more about yeah. Amanda's predicament and how she got out of it? Yeah, so her predicament, I met her at a uh, design conference uh, where there were some world-class designers there. And we love we love AIG, has some great conferences. We have some great ones here, design thinkers in Canada. And I just, I love going to them because they're inspirational. Now, when I met her, um, uh, she was enjoying it, but it, it, there was a bit of melancholy associated with it. So I was trying to dig into it. Um, and she said, well, you know, I just feel like... Uh, like, why am I here? My work isn't as good as this stuff. My work isn't as good as, I, you know. And, and so when I dug deeper, um, you know, she's, a, she's an in-house designer for a hospital. And I looked at her work and, and, it, and it's excellent. And, and you've got to realize that there's a purpose for her work. And that is wayfinding. That is communication in its simplest form. You know, somebody is most likely reading these signs during one of the worst times of their lives, you know, whether it's for a loved one or themselves. So the last thing you want to do is over design. The last thing you want, like it's information design. And I reminded her of that. And, the, and in fact, her work was quite, quite good. Great typography, great color usage on brand. So the last thing she should be doing is, uh, first of all, beating herself up. Secondly, comparing herself to some of these greater designers. When the ones she's comparing herself with are, you know, they have clients like, um, you know, major breweries and, and spirits companies, um, uh, entertainment networks, movies and things like that, which is a completely different uh, pocket and approach. So when I reminded her that come to this as a sponge and just absorb like, wow, that's a great topography treatment. Oh, I love their color here and be inspired instead of uh, diminished. And so it was, it was a great uh, a lesson in that is, you know, if you want to compare, then look at other hospitals and how they're doing. Look right. at people in the healthcare sector, not that's such a, Yeah, that's <laughs> such a great reminder of just like, yeah apples and oranges, right? And thinking about what your references are, even if you're looking for inspiration in other places. Uh, you have also the story about your brother-in-law who was kind of a low-key former Olympian and how he talked about how he doesn't look at other competitors while he was in the race or doing um, the sport. Um, so I think that's a similar point. Absolutely. And that was a, so again, really quiet guy. Uh, I think it was a few years after my sister started dating him that I found out he had been in two Olympics. Like, I said, what? Um, and so I thought, okay, well, here's somebody who competes at an elite level. Here's somebody who competes uh, internationally. So I want to tap into that. I want to understand what is the mindset that you go through when you're, you're at the Olympics and you're in your event and you're, you're looking at the other competitors who are leaders in their countries as well. Like, What's the mindset for that? And I was trying to dig that out. And he just sort of, you know, flippantly said, well, I don't think about them. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He said, the only thing I have control over in that race is my pace, my breathing, and my mindset. And my goal in that event is to better my last time. I want to do a personal best. That's the only thing I can do. Sometimes that's a gold medal. Sometimes that's 25th. 
you never know. But if I'm constantly improving, that is a, a, a win. Yeah, we've been jumping straight into the pool, if you will, of examples from the book. But just to zoom out a little bit, Don't Look for Zebras is like a business book, creative advice and wisdom book. It reads really conversationally and it's got some great illustrations as well with all of these different, like very short digestible chapters. Uh, Can you tell us about the illustrator that you worked with as well? Yeah, so Chell uh, is just an incredible talent. She's, I'm lucky enough to uh, have her uh, in my in my uh, world. Uh, she's a former student um, and uh, a fellow colleague, a teacher, uh, as well as now a, a, a collaborator. And um, I identified her for this book. I originally had black and white photos in the book, which is fine. But I thought, you know what, with the tone, uh, the way I wrote it, it needed to have a little bit more of an edge to it, a little more playfulness. And uh, she, uh, I've always been a fan of her work. And when I saw uh, some of her recent illustrators, I, illustrations, I, I immediately contacted her and said, look, I've got this book. I'd love you to work with me on it. And uh, it's been a great collaboration because some of the stuff she's come up with, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, like the um, illustration she did for the Olympic, my brother-in-law, it's a gentleman running, and he's got a blindfold on and he's going across the finish line. I would have never thought of that, but it's brilliant how it fits into that. Um, so she's added such a wonderful voice uh, to this, just black and white illustrations, uh, but they just need to be color because they're so uh, rich in content. Right. Can you tell us more about the choice of the format, both in terms of the writing style, and you mentioned a little mm-hmm. bit about the choice of the illustrations already, but it's not a sort of self-serious buzzword laden business book. And you chose to no. go a different direction, which I thought was great and really refreshing. But like, um, who is this for in a way? So this is, I mean, you always, the, the, the adage is you always, you write, write a book for yourself, right? Know what you know and write for yourself. And particularly now, again, we talk about niche markets and that is that um, I originally didn't want to write a book because I thought, well, what do I have to say? What do I have to impart? And having taught and and understanding that while there's a lot of books out there, um, none of them have my voice. And there's going to be people out there that will that will resonate with them. I read a great deal. I've got a huge library and there's a good percentage of the books here that I uh, haven't finished. And it's simply because the tone, uh, it was too dense. Um, it just didn't work again, the high school experience again, right? So what I did was this book is written conversationally. Um, the table of contents isn't divided into chapters. It's more like going to the pharmacy and you're like, uh, you know, you're, you're not searching for ibuprofen. You're like, I've got a headache. I need something to get back, get rid of that, right? So when you go to the table of contents, it's like imposter syndrome. Like, okay, yeah, I'm struggling with that right now. Uh, presentation, you know, like you got a presentation coming up. Here's a fun way to prepare for that, that'll make it easier on you. So it's very prescriptive. So you don't have to go through the book linear. You can open it up and just go, oh yeah, this is something I'm dealing with right now. Jump to that chapter and, and read it. Um, and they, they, they all, you know, the thread throughout is, is all mindset and inspiration and building confidence yeah. um, to deliver what you need to deliver. Yeah, if I were to blurb it, I'd call it like nuggets of wisdom on demand, right? Um, Yeah. Because there's these really accessible anecdotes and chapters and making sense of things. And and it's fun with the illustrations and the writing style as well. Yeah, yeah. And that that was, again, that was the intent is just to make it um, very accessible, Mm -hmm. you know, and an easy read to pick it up. You know, I've got a lot, like I said, I got a lot of books here that were just like a real slog to get through. Um, and, um, the, um, so, um, the, um, tagline or the, the sub copy, uh, for the book is, um, um, essays, observations, and rants to ignite your creative brain. And, uh, you having read it, does that, is that a, a good descriptor? I like that. And I like how it's just not so self-serious, right? It's like you acknowledge yeah. that some of them are rants, others are like great stories of wisdom. And it's like, you can take what's useful from it yeah. um, without it being like too much of a, a guru with all of the answers, right? See, that's uh, the it. Humility this is no tome. Right. Yeah, this isn't a thou shalt, thou shalt not at all. This is like, you know what? 
I get it. I've been there. Here's some funny stories. Here's my insights at all these years of doing this. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll take some notes. <laughs> <laughs> So this is your second book now. And as an author, yeah. as a content creator, like a book is still a big undertaking. I think it's helpful oh, yeah. if you folks want to know, like, at what point did you know you were ready? Like, okay, this is going to be a book and I'm going to start this marathon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you you kind of go, uh, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, it's kind of like starting a business in a sense. Like I started two businesses and, you know, I started the second one. I think forgetting what it took to start the first one, <laughs> you kind of have yeah. you know, selective memory. So you're like, I can do this again. And then you dump into it and you're like, oh, right. This is a lot of work. Um, but I think uh, with um, this book here, like my first book is about social media. It has nothing to do with design or anything. It's about how social media uh, is eroding our uh, self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it's funny when I started telling people, oh, I'm writing a book. And I remember my parents saying, oh, it's about design. What about design? Like, uh, it's nothing to do with design because I think there's enough design books out there. I don't know what voice I have. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people are struggling with self-identity and, and the problem with social media. So I published and wrote that book and it went very well. Then I started thinking, well, you know what? Mindset is a big problem. And when I do these, these presentations and keynotes and things like that, that's the feedback that I get a lot of times is people dealing with imposter syndrome and confidence and, and all that. And I'm like, you know what? Um, I was, you know, that ball flower, that um, person that was very um, timid. Uh, and I overcame that through little, you know, little tricks and, and, and awareness. And so, you know what? That's going to be my design book. There's no portfolio in there. It's not about my career. Um, it's observations and things that we can talk about. Um, so, um, I, my process is I write, uh, on paper, pen and paper because I'm quicker than typing. I know it's weird, but it's true. Um, and what I find is, so I'm inspired, I'm just writing away. And then when I'm not particularly inspired, I then take the book and I transcribe, I type it into word. Um, and about halfway through transcribing, I'm back into the mode again. Um, and sometimes I'll dictate. Uh, into my phone, I'll have a conversation with myself. You know, I get weird looks, but you know what? I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, and that's how it comes together. And that's why it's very conversational in its tone. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking to us about with your process and some of this wisdom that you've gained over the years, as well as how you've defined and refined this meaning of mentorship. To wrap up, let's talk about the future since the show is about the future as well. Like what is in the future for you? You are launching the book and promoting the book, but how do you see this in the context of the changing industry as well as it's going out in the world? Yeah. So, um, from my perspective, um, our industry is changing quite a bit, obviously, uh, with social media and things like that. But I think more importantly, it's a fundamental change. Uh, and that is going from um, uh, really an executional industry to a more strategic industry. Um, we're seeing more and more people learning um, online skills uh, on their own through YouTube and uh, videos and hacking through uh, so there's less of a, so, so when we were talking with clients and that, um, it's, uh, well, we got people in-house that we got people in-house. So really where the hole is or opportunity for us is in the strategic side. You know, it's very much, you know, social media is so easy right now. It's one of those just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, having a plan, that's one of the things I talk about is pencils before pixels. Um, and the idea that, you know, your intelligence is anything uh, um, but artificial. Um, so using technology to make our work more efficient, but at the front end, we're more strategic and businesses are recognizing that fast company, Inc. Magazine, you know, they're all dedicating editorial content to uh, design creativity. That's because it is a strategic business element. Um, and that's where we are perfectly, you know, perfectly aligned and we all here now in, in business circles are all talking design thinking right that's the yeah. thing. Um, and we are the best position for that so that's where you know where i see myself going uh and mentoring people and and writing about it to empower our industry to really um fill that role 
Yeah, so many great points there, especially around like all of this anxiety we have about automation or offshoring, outsourcing. It's like it's, you're not yeah. going to compete on price. You're not going to compete with a, a no. robot or an AI. So you have to really yeah. lean into what makes you a human, a creative human, a strategic human that AI can't do or that can't be easily shipped overseas somewhere. Exactly. You know, I, you know, we're not an, an algorithm. Uh, those are all tools. And that's another quote from the book. Uh, forgetting that the computer is a tool makes you the tool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I get a little, you know, that, that's a rant. All right, that's yeah. a rant. Uh, but it's, but it's, it's true. Uh, you know, like pencil before pixel, get your ideas out, then go to the computer. Bring in your human um, approach um, and, and opinion and problem solving, and then allow the computer to build in the efficiency. Yeah. Catherine on LinkedIn has anticipated my next question, which is, where can we get the book? Uh, it's on pre-order now, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Catherine. Um, so it's in pre-order right now. It's going to be shipping at the end of January. But if you pre-order now, um, you will get a signed copy of the book, as well as a, um, a letterpress postcard uh, quote from the book, which is, uh, designing in a vacuum is for Dyson, uh, which is about collaboration. Um, and you can pre-order the book at my website, think-smith.com. And there you'll find um, the book. You'll also find my coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, and again, um, blogs and, and free information. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing a preview of your book, mm -hmm. telling us about your story where you see the industry heading. Do you have any final thoughts of maybe midweek Wednesday wisdom to impart as a final thought before we log off? Wednesday wisdom, Wednesday wisdom. Well, again, you know what? Your brain is beautiful. It really is. And we've been told for so many years, and I don't mean to be Pollyanna, you know, but, you know, uh, the traditional school system and that has been putting people down about the way we think and it's, it, it's not linear. And, and you know what? Uh, things have changed. And uh, the brain you have is beautiful and people need it. Make sure they can find you, make sure uh, they see uh, what you've got um, and, uh, you know, get out there and, and don't listen to um, the other voices out there. Well, wonderful. Robert, thank you for coming on the show again. He's the author of Don't Look for Zebras. You can get it at think-smith.com. This is the last live stream version of the show for the year. So we'll see you in January. In the meantime, what happy about holidays. champagne? I, yeah. I want to pop some champagne. We can pop some champagne or something. We can pop right? some champagne. You can find right. the audio only version of this on the podcast feed uh, next week as well, or just watch the replay. So thanks again. Have Thank a great so week, much. everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.